on this episode of China Unscripted, the Soviet Union fell, but the Cold War never ended. The Chinese Communist Party has taken up the mantle with a few tricks it learned from the KGB. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Chong. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Joining us today is J. Michael Waller, Senior Analyst for Strategy at the Center for Security Policy. It's great to have you back on the podcast. Well, it's nice to be with you all again. Yeah. Well, you know, the last time we had you on, it was just, it was in the before times almost. It was just a few months into uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And we kind of talked about like how the CCP was using it for propaganda. Uh, two years later, how do you think they've done? They've done a great job. The Chinese regime has weaponized the virus to to make us really do what it, they set out to do two years ago, which was to make sure that the Chinese Communist Party wasn't held accountable, made sure that we viewed the Chinese Communist Party as a partner in fighting the pandemic and not a guilty party, and then to praise the Chinese Communist Party and even Xi Jinping for being so helpful and good to all of us to bring this to a close. I'm still amazed at how many times I see in Western media, you know, China's COVID policy worked. They did a great job. It's like, they, 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 they why is that? It <laughs> blows my mind. Yeah, well, it's, it's remarkable to see the lack of criticism of the regime. They say, you, you can round people up in camps. You can put spyware on all their equipment. You can give them social credit scores and weld them into their houses or make them disappear if they say the wrong thing. And somehow that's okay. I'm kind of interested to see what will happen now that there are reporters uh, who are kind of experiencing China's COVID policy. Uh, there was an AP article the other day because now some of the Olympic reporters are going into China's COVID bubble. And it was an AP article about how essentially creepy and weird it was. Uh, and I just thought that was kind of funny in a way, because from the CCP's perspective, I imagine they think, well, journalists coming into the COVID bubble, it's great for us because then they can't go around interviewing pesky human rights activists or whatever. And uh, now instead they're writing articles about how creepy and authoritarian the bubble is. It's really great to see because these are the journalists who are coming in just to cover the sports event. And they're not the ones who need to stay there and need to keep their party issued visas. So they're, you know, they saw what happened to the Washington Post and the other reporters who were thrown out. Uh, so the resident reporters might not do this, but the people who are not accustomed to Chinese ways, or their, their, their party's ways, are coming in and they're really shocked at what, even though they've been briefed in advance. So it's really good to see this kind of reporting coming out because it reaches a whole new audience of people who are just interested in competition and sports and not in international politics. I wonder if anyone in these media companies is doing like a double take, like, wait, I thought this was this was so good. And now, they're, now these reporters are saying it's actually... Not all it's cracked up to be. Yeah, I, I, we'll find out what those uh, executives say and whether the regime cracks down on them and any of the other interests they have on the mainland. Well, so you said the Chinese Communist Party has done a, a remarkable job spinning the coronavirus into essentially a propaganda victory. But don't you think there is a growing awareness of uh, the threat of the Chinese Communist Party and maybe even their influence operations around the world. Yeah, yeah, and this is really the two-edged sword for, for the party. Your first question was, were they able to use this as propaganda? Yes, absolutely. But the second thing is, people are much more aware, especially as we in free societies are finding out we're not allowed to say certain things that are not the approved truth. And we're not I'm sorry, YouTube out. won't allow us to let you say that, so <laughs> we'll have to cut that. I'm sorry. I've been cut off. Okay. <laughs> well, I hope my organs go to some nice person. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, wow. I got really dark. <laughs> hey, stay in your lane. Organ harvesting jokes are our business. Oh. <laughs> Have a heart. Um, sorry, <laughs> you you had a point you were trying to make. I'm not laughing at organ harvesting jokes, but it is kind of yeah weird. Um, it's we were a very special show, right? When you have uh, you know, big entertainment figures who 
might have a different opinion about something that's health related and they're being censored. And, and uh, now a big podcaster, right? Joe Rogan and Neil Young comes and tells Spotify, you know, all of your, your songs about rape and murder and, and abuse of women and everything else are fine. It's just Joe Rogan has a bad take on COVID remedies. So I want you to pull him off Spotify or else you have to pull me, Neil Young, off. I mean, this is how crazy it's gotten. Yeah, Neil Young with like six million hits a month, and Joe Rogan with like two hundred million a month. It was it that many? It's it's a huge difference. It was Neil Young did not back the right horse on that one. <laughs> the right horse, not himself. <laughs> well, I'm talking about. I'm referencing Ivermectin, the horse. Oh, deworm. okay, okay. I'm talking about the horse with no name. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I think, uh, Mike, one of the, the interesting things about the approved narrative was actually something you talked about last time you were on our show, which was whether the coronavirus came from a lab in Wuhan. And at that time, it was definitely not an OK thing to talk about. Uh, people were pretty much ignoring it. And now there's been like a big reversal in, well, I don't know if in everybody's eyes, but the the information coming out has become more and more uh, damning in that respect. Oh yeah, but even if I don't know if you saw the U.S. intelligence report from last summer, where they were like, we can't say. Yeah, well, seventeen our seventeen different intelligence agencies cannot come to a consensus on the origin of the virus, and the unclassified report came out and said we really, really can't know until the Chinese authorities help us. Mm. I mean, come on, what are we paying them for? If our spy services can't even come to an unclassified assessment of this i mean what where are we now this has simmered for two years and for the for the first year or so i mean most people are going to go along and say this is a dangerous pandemic let's not be divisive let's go along with whatever the authorities suggest and then now they're realizing that it's really people really didn't know what they were talking about or even they were following the the chinese party's example on many things and so there's there's a great degradation of trust of our health authorities and our civil authorities who've been who've been imposing these often draconian measures, and people are comparing it to what the Chinese communists are doing. Even look at look at Canada, Australia. Well, I think that's one of the interesting things about the coronavirus pandemics, because you know we've found you know people when we try to talk about you know communist party influence operations, it's always been I think hard for people to connect to. But with the pandemic, you very clearly see how the Chinese communist party was able to influence the narrative and continues to influence how we talk about it. The The intelligence report is a great example of that. You know, like, oh, we, we can't say unless China says. You know who's going to be a special guest at the Olympics? Uh, Tedros from the WHO. Oh, boy. <laughs> we get a gold medal in the lying competition. Oh, my gosh. Well, there's a case of a Chinese influence operation now, a party influence operation, where you have somebody like the head of the World Health Organization – this Ethiopian, not even a physician, is 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 installed basically at Beijing's behest, and then just parrots the Beijing line. And if you trace what he's been saying since the outbreak of COVID, it's not transmissible among humans. Remember, he was saying that two years ago, and and it might not spread that badly. And all these other things, and he would not uh, ever diverge from the party line. And all the statements are still up there; they're still on Twitter. You can follow them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember a, a bunch of uh, global health experts were really upset because the World Health Organization delayed labeling it a pandemic for a long time. And they and health officials made decisions based on what the World Health Organization was saying. And in the end, that turned out to cost people their lives. It did that. And then and then the total dependency of even the United States health institutions on the Chinese Communist Party controlled institutions on what to do. You know, we were all depending on the CCP for this. And for a month, they kept it secret and stonewalled and didn't admit to anything until finally Xi Jinping made a great speech and came out looking like the great savior of the world for in defense against this terrible virus. But it, that's because they had to prepare a line for, for him to make him look good and to raise him up, but to make him look not just blameless, but like part of the solution instead of the problem. And... You know, that took weeks to put together. So it wasn't until uh, what, January 20th, of 2020, that the regime finally came out and said, hey, this is dangerous, but they were still allowing international travel. So this was a great example of uh, the Chinese Communist Party's um, influence operations. 
What I find interesting about the Communist Party is how well they sort of understand American society, particularly political divisions. Like they were able to label any criticisms of China or, you know, trying to hold China accountable for being the origin of the coronavirus. They successfully framed that as, you know, either far right or racist. And then that just got eaten up by American media. Right. They know the knee jerk response that those types of allegations always produce reflexively. But they've had, they've had, you know, a good 30 years or more to really refine their new openness toward the rest of the world, the, the peaceful rise of China. And the more we engage them, and the more we appreciate the special Chinese way of doing things, as if Chinese are inherently communist people who love being repressed. And, and so you didn't have much criticism of this. And then over the course of the decades, just think of where so many American and other Western uh, diplomatic experts, sinologists, intelligence analysts, and others, who taught them in their universities and in their graduate programs and in their language studies programs. These were academics who, in order to get their degrees, had to study in mainland China under Communist Party institutions. And then to, in order to keep their, uh, themselves getting published in peer reviewed journals and all the other things necessary for, for professors to do, they had to be always allowed to go back to mainland China and therefore get visas. So really never do much to discredit the, the uh, Communist Party. And then they became the professors and the trainers and, and, and their students and others would go into the diplomatic service or the intelligence community or, or the congressional staff or the military with this different understanding of China that really it's not such a threat as the right wing crazy, you know, pro Taiwan people say it is. And if you even uh, look at the United States Navy and its Pacific Command, what we've been called the Pacific Command, for 20 years they were talking about really mainland China is really peaceful. It's never going to be a, a naval power of it to any significant degree. We don't have to worry about it that much. Now look at them. All those admirals are retired, but look at who has come up under them. Yeah, China's Navy is bigger than the United States. They're very clearly, uh, they want Taiwan. That's very clear now. Yeah. And so, you know, having a U.S. military policy that was based on, oh, they're not a threat. So that, that clearly was disastrous, especially if a war for Taiwan begins this year, next year, in a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. And, they, and it was always to kick the can down the road about what we'd really have to do about it. But I, I knew a lot of these officers. And once they reached... Uh, the rank of captain, which is the Navy equivalent of an army colonel, right <clears throat> right below flag rank. As soon as they reach the rank of captain, they're weeded out. So the ones who were really good on analyzing the Chinese Communist Party's intentions and the development of the People's Liberation Army Navy uh, were generally weeded out from service and not promoted to admiral. That seems so strange to me. Like, how how could that have happened? How could the military intelligence has been so wrong. But it depends on how the people are trained. So they're, they, they only know what to look for. They want to get promoted. They don't want to make waves. And they know the senior leadership doesn't want to hear certain things. A lot of your career, careerist-minded people will simply analyze with lowest common denominator conclusions to please the people up top. I, back, back in, in 1999, that far back, I went to Panama right when the United States returned the rest of the Panama Canal to Panama. And at that time, uh, the Hong Kong companies were buying up the port facilities just as the U.S. was still leaving. And so they ended up controlling both ends of the Panama Canal. Now, some Taiwan companies were involved as well, but the narrative was, well, these are just Hong Kong companies which, like Taiwan, are not controlled by the CCP. And I was saying, well, wait a minute, the, the big tycoons who are building these ports, they're, they live in Hong Kong, but they're making their living from the CCP. So so it turned out that was indeed the case. This was the early stages for the PLA Navy to be developing controls over maritime choke points. And so, so I wrote several articles about it, and then that got to a senator's attention, Senator John Warner in Virginia, and he held hearings on it. And the Commandant of the Marine Corps various Navy admirals and the U.S. heads of the Panama Canal Commission, they were all asked 
the same question. Is the Chinese military using these companies as forward basing points for the Chinese Navy? And all of them said they didn't know. Like that's that was clear to us. Yeah. Like the, like they, they didn't know, like they, they didn't bother to try to find out or they were just covering for what they did know or I mean. I don't, it's one of the weird things because all of them knew in advance that they were going to be asked the question because that's what the Senate hearing was about. Wow. So, so if you get that now, oh, what, 23 years ago, there was a steep, 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 steep learning curve. And then the same thing when, when Ukraine in, inherited that uh, the Soviet aircraft carrier and they wanted $30 million for it for scrap. It wasn't finished. It was obsolete anyway. And uh, some of us were, were, were working to get the Clinton, Clinton administration to buy the carrier from Ukraine. And they said, no, the U.S. Navy even said, no, it's obsolete. It's a bad hull design. They don't have the right catapults. We don't need it. It's not going to be any good. They say, well, why don't we just buy it to prevent the Chinese from buying it? They said, oh, but that's some businessman who wants to turn it into a nightclub. <laughs> oh, so wrong. Yeah. And that, but that was the CCP propaganda line. It's just an entrepreneur to make it a nightclub or a casino or a resort. And it's really not going to become a carrier. And of course, well, we all know uh, that that advanced the navies, the, the PLA navies, uh, carrier capabilities you know, by 20 or 30 years. It gave them, it, it telescoped it down by 20 or 30 years. So now they're, they're what they're putting their third carrier to see pretty soon. Well, since so many politicians and military personnel have been raised under this horribly wrong worldview, like how long will it take for things to change? Like, are we screwed at this point? Yeah, we're pretty screwed. Oh. Yeah, but but there are still a lot of great opportunities. For example, uh, you know, there, there's nothing better than or, or worse, let's say, if you're considering a careerist in the government, to have been wrong all this time and now be in charge when there's a crisis because they're going to be scurrying around for solutions and finally they get slapped in the face by reality. That's good. The problem is they don't have the trained people behind them to be providing them with a lot of the proper worldview and ideas and understandings of, of uh, how the Chinese military operates in certain ways and how the CCP operates. I mean, it's to the point where to save money on the budget, the CIA stopped translating authoritative Chinese Communist Party publications if they had an English language version. So they were relying on the Chinese Party Communist Party's English language, their own English language versions. And if you do a comparison, you see, well, there are slight differences of wording here and there that are meant to distort Western perceptions. So our own intelligence analysts were not getting the exact meanings that the party was trying to tell its own cadres in these official authoritative publications. They leave stuff out of the English stuff all the time, not even when it comes to like books and things like that. Like if, the press conferences. Yeah, right? Well, yeah, but even if you see there will be like the release of uh, you know, let's say the whole new like history, the CCP's hundred years of history things. So there'll be things in the Chinese that are not in the English. Yeah. So and so, but our intelligence analysts missed this. So they missed these. So it's a say it's a Xi Jinping speech or something, and it's in the People's Daily, and there's an English language version. Our intelligence people revert to the CCP's own English language version instead of the CIA's own English language translation, and not understand these nuances and what they mean. So, so when, when our own intelligence people don't understand what the party cod leadership is telling the cadres, how to think, what to expect, what to talk about and not talk about, that's a big, huge handicap for us because it doesn't allow our intelligence people to advise our decision makers and diplomats about the Chinese Communist Party's attention. Well, well, what I find shocking is like, how did the U.S. have this lackadaisical attitude about China when like this would have never passed with the Soviet Union. And and first of all, I know you have a lot of experience studying the Soviet Union. So could you give us some background on that? Oh, well, yeah, and that experience is one of the reasons I'm still hopeful about China. But, but we'll get to that in a second. But if you look at really the the cover that was given for the Chinese Communist Party was Henry Kissinger. And people like Kissinger and people who wanted to uh, develop their careers or their fortunes around Kissinger, you had Kissinger become a huge intellectual heavyweight, even though he was Richard Nixon's man. Somehow in the 70s and 80s, he started 
re-emerging and reinventing itself as this great wise sage for the rise of a peaceful China and huge economic opportunities for the United States and its friends. And so you have these, uh, you know, nobody wants to cross Henry Kissinger because he will wreck your career if you do. So he was really, in my view, doing the party's work for it by regulating the debate among people who would be very hawkish about China otherwise. You didn't have any more hawkish anti-communists in the early 70s than Henry Kissinger. And using China to offset the Soviet Union, it made sense as a tactical move for the United States during that phase of the Cold War. But he continued to cover for the CCP, as he still does. He's about 100 years old almost, and he's still doing it now. And he's, he, he, he has a, a worshipful following of liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans alike, that's given all this cover, as have a lot of other uh, academic figures, retired diplomatic figures and uh, university professors and think tanks. So you mentioned that your knowledge of the Soviet Union has made you hopeful now with China. Uh, I guess as, as, a, as an entertainer, I should hold that off to the end and build suspense, but I'm dying to know right now. I don't want to wait. <laughs> so just why, why? Why should we have hope? Well, at the time, uh, I came up through a, through an activist background to become, you know, have an academic one. And so I did my PhD research in the Soviet Union and Russian Federation on the Soviet KGB and what was happening to it. So under Gorbachev and then after the collapse under Yeltsin. And, but it was sort of, of a participatory scholarly research. So I wasn't just studying documents, but I was working with Russian activists who were ransacking KGB offices, stealing as much classified material as they can, and then we're going through it to understand what's what. So it was a lot of fun. It was a unique kind of research, but it brought me into a movement that, that showed that these communist systems are fragile. That's why they have to be so repressive. And it, once you understand the, the way it works, say the, a communist party works and a secret police system works as an organism run by human beings, you can start to take it apart. So in the late 1980s, it was the idea of most of the, the foreign policy leadership in Washington. So this is the, the President George H.W. Bush, his whole administration, many other Republicans and most Democrats thought the Soviet Union is always going to be here. It's always going to be run by the Communist Party. It's dangerous to talk of a post-Soviet world and dismantling the Soviet Communist Party and breaking up the USSR because it's just dangerous and more like to do. And we're all on the ground thinking, no, it's not. This thing can be taken down if you kick it hard enough and pull out some of the nuts and bolts holding it together. And lo and behold, it happened far faster than anybody would have imagined. So I can see the same thing happening to the Chinese Communist Party and hope to be around to help give it a push. Well, so what are some of the nuts and bolts of the Chinese Communist Party that need to be unscrewed or kicked? Well, well first, where, where, where in history has it been where some of the richest people in the country fall off skyscrapers or start disappearing? So once the, the party's own billionaires realize they are no longer safe and their money's no longer safe and their assets are no longer safe, their lives are no longer safe, there's a real uh, friction point within the elites of the party that that you can play them off against one another. And the fact that so many of these guys have fallen off buildings and disappeared and so forth. Uh, the same thing with, with sports figures. So, so when some of the most popular or high profile or entrepreneurial people who are sort of of the party, but not necessarily part of the party official machine, uh, they have their own private prestige and private property and private ambitions to protect. And the party's not protecting them anymore. So they're starting to think, what are we going to do against the party? When you saw Hong Kong, so many of the Hong Kong billionaires never wanted to do anything against the Chinese Communist Party until what? Until the party started acting against them and their beloved city, which they had sort of thought kind of would never be taken over by them. Communist Party. I don't know how they thought that, but they did. So once they saw the party was serious about conquering Hong Kong and crushing it, 
and taking away everything they had, the party's building up its own resistance movement. So this is the wealthy figures at the top. And then when you have party decisions being made with companies with fake sets of books on Western capital markets with you know, complete phony spreadsheets on everything, and now people around the world are, just, are realizing, hey, we're losing a ton of money by investing in the Chinese Communist Party. We're going to pull out. Now you have these, these houses of cards collapsing within China, reverberating around the world. So that's a good thing. That shows a real vulnerable point. And, and so on down the line. But some of that, I think one of the greatest things of all is where Xi Jinping is consolidating personal power almost completely to himself, which means that if he's going to take the credit for everything, he has to take the blame for everything. But if you have somebody like him, who everybody fears, who's afraid of Winnie the Pooh, then you know you have a guy with psychological issues that can be manipulated. I thought you were going to say, actually, Winnie the Pooh is the most powerful person in China. <laughs> well, I thought Mickey Mouse on the South Park episode was, but uh, uh, oh, oh, that was disturbing. <laughs> well, I was going to say, are, are we there yet, though? I mean, uh, I feel like wealthy Chinese people have always been trying to get their money out of China. That's why they have the, all the issues with capital flight. Uh, and I think it's probably going to get worse now with the whole common prosperity line that Xi Jinping is pulling in. You know, he's fine with destroying um, Chinese tech companies and things like that in order to bring them under greater control of the party. But I feel like on the Western side, there's still a lot of kind of fantasy land thinking about, you know, making money in China, you know, JP Morgan going into China, Bridgewater, BlackRock, all these, uh, you know, financial institutions. You know, do you think we're going to get to the point where they kind of realize that this is not the way to go? Maybe, but only after they lose a lot and they lose a lot and their shareholders start revolting and people who have IRAs or pension funds or whatever that are invested in this, which most Americans do, whether they know it or not. Um, you know, we see what's been happening in the stock market recently. Part of that's really related to China and COVID. I think if things, if and when things get worse, there'll be a lot more uh, uh, shareholder revolts and other types of, uh, of uh, pushback from those who are losing now losing a lot of money for China, and China has become a bad bet. So Xi Jinping was fine with these billionaires until he started destroying what they were building. He was fine as long as he was helping build it, but now that he's taken the other tack, he's going to be, this is where you have uh, uh, poles of resistance and divisions within the party that if we were smart on the outside, we would exploit it. We'd pay favorites with certain Chinese tycoons and not, not talk about, well, not not avoid, but we, we like to focus on the plight of the uh, individuals or different ethnic groups who are being repressed in China. That's really important to keep talking about. But we have to play games among the people who really still have their hands on levers of control inside the CCP, which is what we're not doing and we should be. We had a, a guest on a, a little while ago, Serge Popovic, who was a Serbian activist, and he talks about uh, what he calls pillars of support. So, you know, the, the financial elites are a, a pillar. The military is a pillar of support. The uh, police are a pillar of support uh, and, and so on. And these different groups that are kind of propping up uh, a regime in general, but in this case, the Communist Party. So what other pillars of support or what other groups uh, are kind of like the a, a nut, a nuts and bolts or a Jenga block that could be taken out? Uh, that would that would cause problems for the party. Well, you, you've got your your big banks, you've got your big media your companies like Disney, NBC, other big media companies that that uh, don't permit criticism of the Chinese regime, and really the regime now tells them what to do instead of them using their own judgment about what not to do. There's more pushback against this. There's there's more um, public awareness that thanks to COVID and thanks to the attention being brought on the, uh, the plight of the Uyghurs and the attention of certain American athletes who are perfectly fine with slave labor being used to uh, make the products that they have their names branded on. So there's, there's more awareness uh, for pushback in that regard. And then you have a lot of now people from Hong Kong uh, who around the world now who are 
informing other people. They speak perfect English. They fit right into to English speaking societies around the world. They're able to get the word out a lot more about what's happened to them and their their city. And they're starting to work now with people in Taiwan where they might not have done so before. And there's there's sympathy toward Taiwan because it's the little guy in all of this. People like an underdog. And so you've got a big bully getting ready to gang up on Taiwan the way it's been, you know, so abusive toward everybody else. This is all behavior that the, the Chinese Communist Party is inflicting on itself by being aggressive in this fashion. And then the whole concern now over over Russia and Ukraine also heightens awareness among, especially among Americans and Europeans, because well, if there's a crisis in Ukraine, what are we going to do about the crisis in Taiwan? We can't handle both crises effectively at the same time, especially if they go kinetic. So these are all concerns where people are starting to think, including people in Washington who don't really think in geostrategic terms, even though they talk about it. They are now really thinking seriously about it now and coming to quiet uh, agreements and dialogues, even among their political opposites, about what we need to do. Now, Mike, you mentioned the idea of like playing off different people, like wealthy Chinese businessmen or uh, people within the party uh, against themselves. We've talked about a lot of power struggle stuff on on our show before, but do you remember the longer telegram thing that was going around uh, maybe about a year ago or so where an anonymous writer had written a piece for the Atlantic Council where they were essentially saying we shouldn't have a regime change in China, but we should get rid of Xi Jinping. So is that a concern that like, if there is a power struggle within the CCP that brings down Xi Jinping, but the party itself could still survive and continue to do everything it's doing? Right. Yeah. So there are groups, uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry has been quietly promoting this idea of building international pressure to get Xi Jinping removed from power in China. Now, that, to me, that's a really neat development because you're having now people who were generally very, very, very soft on the Chinese Communist Party now taking part in going against its, its leader. But they're not doing it for altruistic reasons. They're doing it more for financial reasons because Xi Jinping, instead of being a big moneymaker, looks like a big threat to those who were making so much money from him. There is no talk of taking down the, you know, removing the, or, or dismantling or dividing up the Chinese Communist Party itself, to, given the nature of the party. And so that's a much bigger issue. It's, it might be a relief valve to, to have find a way to get Xi Jinping ousted by his own uh, standing committee on the Politburo, but it's just going to bring in another communist who came up with him and through him and and who's who's still part of the problem you're not going to find a chinese gorbachev but it wasn't you know, remember gorbachev wanted to save the soviet union and the communist party and the bush administration was trying to save those things as well by working with gorbachev they did not welcome the rise of boris yeltsin at all they feared it so sure let's let's go along with that longer telegram idea and and uh as baby steps toward uh isolating Xi Jinping within his own party and promoting his ouster. But really, we should not be satisfied with that at all, because the whole party represents a threat to the whole world as long as it's ruling, as long as it exists in any form. Why was the U.S. trying to save the Soviet Union? Because that's all they knew. So, so having been knowing some of the players at the time and working with them, you know, Condoleezza Rice was then, then President Bush 41's national security a council staffer to handle the Soviet Union. And she was really scared of what would happen if the Soviet Communist Party collapsed. And the whole Bush administration was, really most of Washington was, could there be a nuclear war? Could there be the scattering of nuclear materials to terrorists around the world? Could, could some other terrible calamity happen? So it was that fear of the unknown and being content with what they do know that was motivating the Bush administration to try to save the Soviet Union. Remember, Bush gave that speech in Kiev, Ukraine, before the Soviet collapse because Ukraine wanted independence from the Soviet Union. And Bush said, well, well, calm down, slow down now. Let's not be hasty about this. It was called the Chicken Kiev speech by its detractors. 
Uh, Condoleezza Rice wrote that speech, but that sort of set the mood for what the Bush administration was doing. And now there was a need also to sort of guide the collapse because you can't necessarily have a foreign communist party, whether it's Soviet or Chinese, simply collapse on its own if it's a nuclear power. Uh, you want to guide it as it's falling down, at least in, in these guys, in these policymakers' view. Well, I guess it's somewhat encouraging that, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed despite the United States and its actions. So that might be hopeful for the fall of the Chinese Communist Party. It's, it, it'll happen despite our own repeated ignorance and greed. But uh, I did want to talk about how what the CCP has learned from the Soviet Union. And originally, I want to talk a lot about um, influence operations, but I think it's also interesting to talk about what the Chinese Communist Party learned from the fall of the Soviet Union, because obviously that's something they want to avoid. Yeah, they were intensely interested in that as a study. They still study it uh, within the party now to learn from those mistakes and how to, how to address them. So they're much wiser because the Soviets never thought they could collapse. Although the KGB, the secret police in the Soviet Union, was fearful of a collapse. So there was a KGB really? was actually driving a lot of the reforms within the Soviet Communist Party because they knew the truth. Hmm. Not even the party members knew the truth. That's interesting that maybe today in China there is a group of people who do know the truth. Well, I think it, it is there is that danger of drinking your own Kool-Aid, right? Yeah. 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 Well, so um, – because Chris, you just asked like a, a bunch of different questions about the Soviet Union, but I – uh, maybe we can start with... No, I asked one. <laughs> You're... Yes, you did. I did. I asked uh, what China learned from the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah, but I, I want to get to... Well, okay, yes, <laughs> that's what happened. Uh, but I'm, I'm interested, Mike, uh, in terms of the Soviet influence operation sort of during the height of the Soviet Union, how was the Soviet Union able to... Or what did they do that was successful at influencing the the U.S. narrative about the Soviet Union or uh, the U.S. discourse about the Soviet Union? How do they do those, those influence operations? Well, the Soviet system was really state-of-the-art at the time. They, they worked in, in two main separate ways. First was through control of international communist parties, which was big in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, but it sort of was going out of style in much of the world after that, but they still had controlled communist parties. So nearly every communist party in every country in the world was controlled by the Soviets, including the very small one in the United States. That didn't matter on in terms of winning elections, but what mattered was the subversive elements of, of any communist party, which was to infiltrate mainstream parties and universities and think tanks and news organizations and so forth with their own controlled people. And that's where the Soviets were very effective. So, so one can, can credit or blame the KGB as a very professional service in terms of stealing secrets as an intelligence organization. But I think even more important was the influence operations that the KGB ran, which had a much stronger effect on saving the Soviet Union for as long as it could. If you think of the reason why the United States and, and its allies don't have real defense against incoming missiles beyond the short-range one, that was because of what the Soviets called an active measures campaign that they began in the 1980s to make sure that the United States would never have a missile defense system. And it worked. And we still don't have one. So we have, you know, we can get the shorter range ones, but you can see through, say, Israel's Iron Dome, with the U.S. Israeli, with the U.S. Israeli system, how wonderfully it works, and those are just against very crude missiles. Once we have a way to shoot down intercontinental ballistic missiles, whether they're Russian or People's Liberation Army or anyone else, uh, we would neutralize the effectiveness of their strategic weapons force, and, and therefore any real effects that they might have on forcing our hand on something. So the Soviets were very successful with that. They were successful in uh, stopping boycotts of the Soviet economy. They were successful in uh, getting pipelines built to Europe. And this was in the in the 80s to make Europe dependent on Soviet gas and to 
have Europe as the real source of hard currency to keep the Soviet economy alive. Now, Reagan fought that in a magnificent covert operation by uh, allowing General Electric to sell turbines to power the Soviet gas lines in Soviet Central Asia. And uh, But they had a, a, a software defect in them that would cause them to overheat and explode and destroy the pipeline, which is precisely what happened in one very celebrated case. And it set back the Soviet pipeline for, for many, many years. Uh, they the, the Soviets were also very skilled at, at working with proxies. So if you're looking for Russians under every rug, it might not be Russian. It might be a West German. It might be French. It might be a, a Cuban. It might be, you know, someone from any part of the world who is actually a Soviet agent who's working uh, as a surrogate, either under direct KGB control or indirectly through the security services of, say, the Cubans or the East Germans. We, we, we really underestimate the Cubans. They were really good at political warfare and subversion, and they remain among the best in the world at that. And they're, and they're helping the Chinese Communist Party. Well, when we talk about Soviet influence operations, I always think about how Bernie Sanders had his honeymoon in the Soviet Union, correct? How does that happen? Uh, we, <laughs> wherever you get your kicks, I guess. But he, he was here, – here's a guy who, who – Let's presume he is, quote, only a socialist who chose to go to the Soviet Union just because he's a contrarian uh, and, and likes to shake up the system. So let's not ascribe ill motives to him. Throughout his entire political career in, in the House of Representatives and the Senate, he reflected Soviet active measures themes. He, he magnified them. He, he uh, work them into discourse. And even though he was considered a fringe element in Congress at the time of the Soviet Union, he was still a very important point as a, as a, uh, as a magnifier or a repeater. Okay. So, so Bernie Sanders as an openly socialist member of Congress working within the Democrat party repeated the Soviet propaganda line as did a, no, a number of other Congress members of Congress from Massachusetts, New York predominantly, where they had old Communist Party ties under Soviet control. So Sanders is not originally from Vermont. He's from Brooklyn, which is sort of the center of the U.S. Communist Party in the United States. Now, I don't know if he is or was a party member, but he was certainly raised by them and grew up around them. And he was never hostile to the Soviet Union. Again, as you said, taking his honeymoon there during the Cold War. So, but he wasn't the only one. There are other members of Congress who were who are uh, not as radical, who were also repeating these Soviet active measures lines. And we found actually in our documentary research in Moscow from the um, Soviet Communist Party General Secretary's uh, vault that uh, Senator Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts had reached out to the KGB in 1977 saying that he wanted to run for president of the United States, and that he would help the Soviets if the Soviets would help him. And there's a series of correspondence between then KGB chairman Yuri Andropov as memoranda to the Soviet Politburo reporting on what Kennedy wanted. And then what he ended up getting paid was uh, in oil from Angola for his family's uh, uh, home heating oil charity in New England to help people through the cold winter. And then when Angola decided after the Soviet collapse to cut this off, the oil came from Hugo Chavez in Venezuela to the Kennedy Family Foundation. But we have these actual documents from Gorbachev's personal archive signed by KGB chairman Yuri Andropov previously when Brezhnev was running the Soviet Union. And then memos to, from the KGB to Andropov when he was Communist Party chief and later uh, and Gorbachev was on the Politburo at the time. So this is a case of a United States senator putting himself openly, well, secretly, but I mean plainly for the Soviets, at the service of Soviet intelligence to suit his own political interests. That's that's shocking. That that's actually could be a good topic for our did upcoming that, history channel. Did that make a splash at all? When, like, do I mean, I don't remember ever reading anything about this yeah. related to... Ted Kennedy. Yeah, this was this was uh, written by a Russian journalist named Yevgenia Albats, and she was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard when she did this project. 
And she didn't understand American politics. So she thought, hey, the Boston Globe will love this. It's a local story. Or, of course, the Boston Globe editorially would bury a story like that, which it did. So she had this in a book that she wrote about the KGB called uh, The State Within a State. And then Paul Kangor at Grove City College had some other archive material from the same cache of document. And I was there in 1992 when Evgenia Albots got them. And, uh, and so Kangor reprinted a, a three-page KGB report about Ted Kennedy and his activities and who he was working through and who his California interface was. It was a guy named uh, David Carr. Uh, David Carr was a writer for the Daily Worker, which was a Stalinist newspaper published in New York in the 1930s and 40s. He then went on to work in the civil rights movement, which got J. Edgar Hoover after him because he was a Soviet agent, and then went to work with then Senator Alan Cranston of California and Senator John Tunney of California. So it was David Carr was the KGB go-between with Senator Ted Kennedy through former Senator Tunney. It's all in these documents, and it's fascinating, but they never would have been seen the light of day had, had these journalists and human rights activists not sacked certain KGB buildings and Gorbachev's own, you know, archives for all the Communist Party general secretaries. Think of what's in the CCP archives. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I'm wondering now, because there's a lot of disbelief, I think, in CCP influence operations in the U.S. and the idea that people could be um, being influenced by the CCP or that there's infiltration in different uh, like there's a lot of pushback to the investigation the FBI was uh, is currently doing into academics, right? Who have worked with China and the South, Thousand, uh, Thousand Talents program, things like that. There's a lot of uh, you know accusations of racism about that, and I think in some individual cases it seems like the FBI's investigations have not panned out. Um, but I think in general there's this disbelief that this could actually be happening. In the U.S. at the time, or after the fall of the Soviet Union, was there the recognition that the Soviet influence operation had gotten as big and deep as it has gotten, or was there just a lot of kind of denial and sweeping it under the rug since you know the Soviet Union's not around anymore anyway? Yeah, it depends on who you listen to. So, so you know, people who are are uh, their job is to to find these things. You know, they would get it right away, but your average person regardless of politics, would say, oh, you know, come on, that's crazy talk. You know, this is McCarthyism. This is just tinfoil hat talk. And then they would try to just kill the discussion that way. Now they say, with the case of China, oh, you're just a racist. So that's the standard excuse, too. Yes, Shelley, you're just a racist. Mm -hmm. Which is, now here's another thing that came out of COVID. You had the very inactive Chinese-American community here in terms of politics. And so many of them have become so outspoken against the Communist Party, participating in protests, getting active in, in writing and informing people that that whole racist tag is is dissolving because you have, you know, people say, look, I, I lived in that system or something. I was part of that system. This is really how it works. And now you have even some attacks of people who are more sympathetic toward the CCP trying to say, oh, no, the Chinese American population here is now it's becoming right wing. They're not very credible. And there's so there's an attempt to marginalize Chinese Americans as an emerging political force. Yeah, I, there was a Vice News like little piece that they like a video that they did about Chinese Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. Um and it was actually for Vice mostly fairly non-judgmental. But the most per the person that they had interviewed the most was this Chinese dissident who had been a journalist in China, and she had been locked up in China for her journalism. She came to the U.S. Um, as an asylum seeker and um, went to a Trump rally. Mm -hmm. And then they interviewed her, and she was talking about how you know in China, like this, the government is covering up the the, the truth and the news, and now Americans are learning that this is the case, et cetera. And then. They tied her to Q, essentially, uh -huh. by saying that, you know, then she came across, I don't know what else she talked to them about on, you know, in the course of their entire interview, but like halfway through uh, the the Vice News piece, suddenly like Q comes up 
And then it has her talking about how she like watches a video on Q and she totally could believe that there's this conspiracy and she believes that there's a swamp in Washington, D.C., something like that. So mm. it was not like outright condemning her, but it kind of portrayed her as like just kind of naive or maybe traumatized by her experiences in China. So then she fell for Q in the U.S. Yeah, the the media's take on a lot of not just Chinese Americans, but like Chinese activists who are in the U.S. now, just they, they couldn't handle the idea that like, you know, these people are minorities, but they are also saying Trump is doing good on China. That was just like a short circuit that they couldn't get around. I, I, I recommend this piece by Perry Link in the New York Review of Books, where he just very kind of calmly and rationally talks about why some prominent, very intelligent Chinese dissidents and intellectuals supported Trump and that not all of them did. Many of them were against him, but that there was the split in the Chinese dissident community and it had nothing to do with believing in things like you. It was about the fact that, you know, it was essentially about the f absolute failure of U.S. policy toward China for decades and the uh, fact that like the U.S. government never listened to these Chinese dissidents who were trying to tell them what the what the CCP was. Yeah. I mean, here Trump was was the really the only president who was ever tough on the Chinese Communist Party since 1949, right? But really tough on them. You can understand how any Chinese American, especially immigrants who can vote, who might be socially liberal, and I know some who had supported Hillary Clinton in the 2020 election, but they loved what Trump was saying about the CCP and they gravitated to that. But I think any politician who would be tough on the CCP could get that same voter base, if they're a, if they're a one issue voter who, who really cares about you know going after the party back in in the old homeland, but so, so you had this uh, now you have a demonization of a lot of Chinese Americans who are speaking out against the CCP because they might have supported Trump or because they're sounding like Trump, and this again will go into uh, to benefit the the party's propaganda machine, whether or not it's doing it on its own, and one presumes it is, and if you see certain things in the Global Times and elsewhere, and on Twitter from CCP outlets, you can see how they're taking advantage of it, that uh, that uh, to use this race card now that if you're against CCP, uh, you are you hate Chinese people, and if you're a Chinese American, you're really a banana who's white on the inside, and, you, and you're not a real Chinese person. And one thing I want to add, Shelley was mentioning how like um, all, like everything the FBI is doing about these academics who have mysterious ties to the Chinese Communist Party, how you know that's been called racist. I'm just also reminded of the 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 Hunter Biden story and how that was just killed in the media ahead of the election in 2020. And that's that's I think that's another great example of how discourse on the Chinese Communist Party is being held up. Yeah. It really is. And then if you have news organizations that say, say Bloomberg, where the owner has so many investments tied to the CCP and he exercises editorial supervision pretty well over his, his uh, ostensibly uh, non-biased you know, news entity. So if Bloomberg's doing that. Other news outlets are doing that. Uh, certain TV outlets are doing that. And then the, the talking heads that they use as experts uh, on the, on the subject who, what, they come from Brookings Institute? How much money does Brookings take from the Chinese Communist Party companies and, and their related interests and their American partners? You know, you've got the, the, the John Thornton Center there that's tied in with Tsinghua University, and, and that's their center of, of China studies at, at the most influential think tank in Washington. So it's dependent on the Chinese Communist Party for, its, for much of its funding, and, and then uh, uh, so many American universities are. Look at what Princeton was getting from Chinese Communist Party funded entities at the Biden Center there. But, you know, you know, it's almost like name the university that has a China studies program or an international relations program, Georgetown University right here in Washington, D.C. They they're they're going to be extremely careful of offending the Chinese Communist Party. So that means their professors are in the classroom and the books they write in the articles they write in the media appearances that they make and then in the public positions they take when they're called out of academia to serve in a presidential administration. Mm. Yes, this is what makes it so hard to identify influence operations because it's not like 
the Communist Party is, you know, installing its trained agents as U.S. professors or installing its trained agents as CEOs of American companies or whatever. It's a, you have, you know, regular Americans who, uh, for whether it's for their careers or for money or for, you know, political reasons are, uh, you know, to some degree siding with the Communist Party narrative and pushing that, but it's really for their own benefit. And the Communist Party is able to take advantage of that to push their agenda. Like, it's not like, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very subtle thing and it takes advantage of this kind of free speech. Because if you're a professor in the US, like you can say what you want. It's okay to say, you know, uh, you have this view or you have a completely different view, right? That's kind of how ac academics is supposed to work, theoretically. So it's like no one can say for sure why your uh, view on China is so pro-communist party. Like you're allowed to have that view. But from the Communist Party's perspective, they've worked for a long time to gradually and subtly influence that view. Right. And they did it by, by a very positive uh, strategic campaign of, of seduction, of, of appealing to cooperation and understanding. And it's all very positive. China's peaceful rise and, well, China's very different and you Westerners don't understand. Let us show you. And by the way, would you like to be part of this academic program? And how can we support your own studies program? And maybe offer some scholarships for some of your students to come and study at, in, in China for a year. And let's just build relations like this and see, you know, what good can come out of it. And over the years, hey, these are really great relationships, but you're not going to say something to jeopardize those relationships. To the contrary. And it's not all necessarily pro-CCP in saying that the party is good or Xi Jinping is good. That would be, quote, that would be sort of a party line. And you do have some people giving that party line, especially at the, at the Thornton Center at Brookings and elsewhere where it's a 100% party line. But the real pernicious propaganda is that which is subtle. It's, well, you have to understand, Xi Jinping doesn't feel secure. And so if he's to help China advance with its huge population and its big social problems, he has to get tough with people. And remember, the Chinese people are different from us. So we just have to be understanding of this. Yeah, I mean, you, you got to understand that sometimes you need to lock up a million ethnic minorities. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, it's it's just, that's just their way of doing things. Yeah. It, that does make it harder to make that argument, I feel. Like the Uyghur situation, I think, has made it harder for people to uh, say some of these things about China. Yeah, and, well, and the, and the Chinese government really worked that well. They they bought off Pakistan quickly, so the Pakistanis aren't complaining about the Uyghurs. They bought off the Saudis as big oil customers are trying to replace uh, the United States as the guarantor of, of Saudi security and, and, uh, and maybe even replace the petrodollar. And so the Saudis have an interest in not saying anything about it. Qatar has an interest in not saying anything about it. Uh, so much CCP money is tied up in Dubai and the, 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 the Emiratis aren't going to say anything about it. So you have the most influential Muslim dominated countries in the world, uh, all being quiet about this stuff. So if they're not upset about it, why should the rest of the world be upset about it? It is interesting that on the list of, um, you know, people coming to the Olympics are also prominent leaders from the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, like just large parts of the Middle East. Uh, Pakistan, obviously, prime minister is going. So, yeah, the the list that the CCP released of the people who are the dignitaries who are coming to the uh, Olympics is quite telling. Yeah, yeah, and and not a peep of um, what I think the Czech Republic said they weren't sending some people, and there's sort of a lame diplomatic boycott from from other countries. But it's it's sort of a, a too little, too late type of thing. It, one has to wonder, like in the case of Qatar, where, where you have the FIFA games this year, in soccer, uh, where there was a huge amount of corruption in getting FIFA to approve Qatar as the host for the games this year. Imagine the corruption within the International Olympic Committees on making, making the 2022 games again in China. Well, I think also a big part of it is the Cold War was awful 
after the fall of the Soviet Union, nobody wanted to hear that it's not over. Uh, we're still in a Cold War with China. So I think I think that was also just people couldn't handle hearing the reality. Right. And, you know, we're at war 20 years in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq and we had the Soviet thing behind us. And why are people why are you Americans or we Americans always looking for enemies? Why can't we just get along together? Why can't we just have have peace through trade? And, and, and China's going to reform. The wealthier it becomes, the more democratic and pro-Western it's going to become. That was the party line all these years. Didn't pan out that way. But of course, that was never the plan for the party. So we ended up deluding ourselves based on just the power of suggestion from Beijing. And when whenever Americans would go to do business or whatever else, diplomacy with China, the line was, Look, just help us out, help us advance, and things will turn out okay. So that was the, the peaceful rise of China. Now to get back to some of the questions you were asking before about the, about the Soviet side of the propaganda, now you have the more aggressive, nasty, threatening side of the Chinese Communist Party that that turned on a dime right about the time of the uh, pandemic. So the CCP has become more Soviet-like in being intimidating with its what wolf diplomats, and mm. and you know you never you never had this before where you'd have diplomats coming out taunting people with you know snide memes and, and tweets and all these other things that were were never allowed before, and then you know their ambassador to South Africa and some diplomat someplace else are coming out and they're actually building up a big following because they're so controversial, and and it works as an intimidating factor. So, so they have become more Soviet-like. In fact, there's a there's a fantastic new study. It's over 600 pages long of Chinese Communist Party influence operations worldwide. It was published in October by the French Armed Forces Ministry, their defense ministry. It's available in English, and it's a superb study that breaks down the CCP's entire um, global influence structure and its operations and its methods and and how it worked everything from and not even uh, not even promoting people who support the ccp but promoting opponents of the ccp in order to control opposition abroad to the ccp and to divide them and set them against one another it's a fascinating study that i'm only part way through it right now but it's this type of thing that is that is getting people to to pay more attention. So if this kind of product is coming out of the French defense ministry, we can imagine that others are, are going to be paying really close attention to it because it's not the Americans saying it. We can put a link to that uh, in the description below so people watching can check it out. I'm interested in a little bit about the whole controlling the opposition thing that you just talked about. Well, controlled opposition is a really old political warfare technique. I think the best example was called the trust and the trust was an operation that the bolsheviks ran in the 1920s so their 1920s you've got the russian civil war going on you've got many different factions fighting one another and fighting the bolsheviks and the bolsheviks wanted to crush all of their opposition but they didn't have a way to do so in that in the situation that they were in so most of those factions needed money they hated other factions, and they needed weapons. So the Bolsheviks funded and armed their own opponents for several years in the 1920s during the Civil War. And they did this so they could identify who was whom in their opposition. So Russian citizens inside Russia, Soviet Russia, um, expats who were fighting abroad, and then others like uh, Poles or, or French or Americans or whoever else, Brits, who were involved in helping them. So by funding their own armed opponents, these guys were actually killing Bolsheviks, but by funding and arming them, the Soviets were able to lure some of their key leaders back to Russia and then at, at a certain point had them all killed. Magnificently, you know, I mean, it's a sick operation, but if you look at 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 the exquisite way in which it was done, it was brilliant because that's what saved Bolshevik Russia. So what I'm hearing from this is that the United States should sell military equipment to China. 
I think we were doing that, but I don't think we had the trust in mind. <laughs> so what can the U.S. do about China's influence operations? Well, I think a lot of it is uh, we, we really have to clean out their overt um, institutional groups, like, say, Confucius centers, Confucius Institutes, which are already being done. Now that people are aware of them. And, the, and how harmful they are. And it's being done worldwide. Uh, but they have to be really run out of every university that receives federal funding. And so the federal government can mandate that, saying, you want federal funds? Get rid of these guys. So that's one very important thing, because, because what those those centers do is they, with their language training programs, they're, they're, they serve to indoctrinate those learning Mandarin, but also to scout for talent. Who is the aspiring diplomat? Who is the aspiring businessman or intelligence officer? And how can we target that person and tag that person, identify that person, and then ultimately uh, assess, cultivate, and recruit that person over some course of that person's professional lifetime? So it's a really dangerous system there. I, I would certainly have reciprocity with CCP media. So if any CCP media operating in the United States, the United States must demand uh, reciprocal privileges inside mainland China. And that's not happening. Yeah, ending um, uh, U.S. investments or in China, let's say public pension funds, so where, say, the governor of West Virginia, who just went after BlackRock and said, we're not you're not going to handle West Virginia state pension funds anymore. If other state treasurers and state pension funds were able to go to these private fund managers for their state pension systems and labor unions were to do the same and others and say, we're going to cut you off because you're doing business with communist China and you're putting our own investments at risk. Then, then that would really go a long way to help to, to, to prevent CCP companies from entering U S capital markets and getting investments and from being publicly traded on U S and other Western uh, stock exchanges would be a huge help because it would help dry up funds and, and show CCP entrepreneurs how their own leadership is damaging their own interests. So these are good steps where we can start. And also to prevent, uh, to enforce federal law, which is where, where Communist Party members are still, it's a 1930s law, can still be banned from entering the United States. And since so many of the students coming to the United States from mainland China are either party members or are children of party members. You know, the universities like them because they pay in cash. They should be banned from from entering on a student visa. Uh, or once they're here, they should not be allowed to be part of research programs that have certain high-tech or military applications that, that so many of these individuals have been assigned to steal and take back to mainland China. And then crack down on professors like that Harvard chemistry professor who had the, the laboratory and was getting the secret funding from the, the CCP without disclosing it to Harvard. Uh, there's been a, there's been a, you know, he was arrested. The FBI had a big investigation of him. Uh, he has essentially committed espionage, but not under the laws the way they're written because it's a different type of Fine. It doesn't classify, so they're getting him on other crimes. But these types of cases are very hard to prosecute. That's why that case that you raised earlier about another academic being arrested and then let go, it, it's it's very hard to build certain cases uh, for reasons because we have just linguistic and other capabilities that are limited within the FBI. And then our laws haven't kept up with certain spying and illegal influence methods that the Chinese regime has has uh, introduced here. So get these types of, of uh, bad actors out of our research institution and, and don't allow them here and then penalize research institutions that depend on federal funding uh, when they do allow such individuals to, to occupy sensitive research posts in our, in our institution. So those are just starting points. Then you have members of Congress who, who are, uh, they on the take might be the word, but certainly they have financial interests in appeasing Beijing. There's no shortage of them, Democrat or Republican. Do you think there's anything the U.S. should not do? 
well, not, not continue with the way it's been it's been going. It it, it has to. Well, Secretary of State Pompeo and Attorney General Barr had it right. So they had an interagency approach to educate the American public, to educate universities, private companies, governors. So you had Pompeo made that speech to the American Governors Association with all 50 state governors and the territorial governors all there, bipartisan, saying, all of you have been targeted by the CCP. You've been targeted personally. You've had psychological assessments run up of you. They know your donors. They know your desires. They know your political standing and your political needs and how to influence you, as well as state legislators and even mayors. But the Chinese Communist Party and the MSS Intelligence Service are running those deep dive research assessments of our politicians down to the local level to see how can they be manipulated to do what the party wants done not just on the immediate term, but on the very long term, 10, 20 years out. You know, we're in a lot of trouble. So Pompeo did a great job on this, uh, warning the governors. The FBI did a great job on, on uh, being re, uh, repurposed to go after a lot of these networks operating here. And you did have some real bipartisan interest at first, where you had the uh, president of the Senate, I think, of Wisconsin, who was a Democrat, who was given a template uh, resolution to introduce into the Wisconsin legislature, sort of praising China and the and the, uh, the Chinese government and the having better relations between the state of Wisconsin and the Chinese government. It was written by the by the Xi Jinping's consul in Chicago, and it was sent to other states too. Some of them, some of the legislation was passed in other states. So these kinds of things we really have to crack down hard on, regardless of who's president or who's in office, because it's something that affects everybody. Yeah, it truly is a bipartisan issue. Yeah. What's troubling now is this conflict with, with, with Russia and Ukraine is that, that you see almost, you see very, very, very few advocates of a robust presence to support Ukraine, which is not an ally, uh, to, they don't want to talk at all about China. And the commitments we have in East Asia and really the arguably the greater importance East Asia has for the United States than a place like Ukraine. So I'm very sympathetic toward Ukraine, but but Xi Jinping and Putin would like the United States to be involved on two fronts simultaneously where we don't have the capacity and the physical or even the intellectual bandwidth to deal with, with two simultaneous conflicts like that. Well, I think on that note, it's uh, probably about time we wrap up the podcast for today. Thank you for joining us. This was, I found some things to be hopeful about. Oh, I'm terrified. Uh, don't worry. American incompetence can't trump the f incompetence of communism. Churchill <laughs> said something like that, actually. <laughs> yeah. We should put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> uh, All right. Thanks again for joining us. Uh yeah, well, we'll hope we'll have you on again soon. Okay, we'll see you. Take care. So I got to say, I'm I'm very encouraged by everything that was said. You know, I I always felt a little sad that I missed the Cold War. Really? Yeah, and it seemed so exciting, like all the James Bond movies. But fortunately, it never ended, and we're still in a Cold War. Wow, that's beautiful, Chris. I know, thank you. Silver lining and all. I think this is actually worse in a way because we don't know we're in a Cold War. That's right. Otherwise, James Bond would be fighting China more. That's never going to happen. It's never, ever going to happen. <laughs> they changed, like, what was that one? The Red, Red, Red Dawn, Dawn from, to North Korea. Like, that's just never going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Unless um, somehow Hollywood gets really burned by the Chinese Communist Party. It would need to be, like... Mike was saying, like how like Chinese billionaires are getting burned. Mm -hmm. Like it, if this cascades down the line, then maybe at some point Hollywood will be like, well, you know what? Hollywood is like a jealous lover, one scorned. I want to, you don't want to deal with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the latest James Bond movie, there was a, a piece related to a disputed island, but it was between Russia and Japan. Uh, and I was thinking while watching it, like, if they had set this on a disputed island in the South China Sea, 
Now that would have been interesting. Or the, you know, the disputed island between Japan and China. Or between the U.S. and Canada. Is that disputed? That's not important. Well, the lesson is tell your friends and family the Cold War never ended. Oh, my gosh. That was loud. But you got to say it loud. You have to. Maybe with a crazed look in your eye (laughs) so they know it's serious. Definitely. (laughs) Are you sure you're a communication professional? I never made that claim. Uh, That's good. Thanks for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And we'll talk to you next time with a crazed look in our (laughs) eyes. (laughs) Ugh. <sighs>